So the third question I want to address is one of self-isolation. A lot of people are beginning to ask questions about this. And, you know, truthfully, a week ago, it seemed like a crazy idea. And today it doesn't seem like that crazy of an idea. Now, I'm not here to sort of explain, you know, or prescribe the extent to which one should consider self-isolating, because frankly, not everybody is even in a position to do that. Um, but the more people who are in a position to do it, choose to do it, the better we are. Because in the end, what we want to do is reduce the contact that every one of us has, both people that potentially have the virus and those who don't, because we become vectors to contract the virus and go on to spread it to others. Now, one of the things our team is looking into now that I alluded to in a previous video is the transmissibility of SARS-CoV-2 specifically. Um, and through different means. Now, um, I believe in a previous video I talked about, uh, actually it was in the podcast with Paul Graywall, I think I talked about how long um, the virus appears to survive on various surfaces, whether it be cardboard, plastic, steel, copper, things like that. Um, and those were, those were sort of disturbing um, uh, facts because, you know, it suggested that the virus could survive a day, easily a day, on, on some of these surfaces. It depended on the surface, you know, copper was less than steel, for example. Um, but in that same paper, which was a preprint in the New England Journal of Medicine, and by the way, I'm still only seeing the preprint, so that means it hasn't yet been peer reviewed and you should always take that with a grain of salt. But in these times, we're looking at everything and we're looking at things that are coming out ahead of publication because the authors are gracious enough to put them out there sooner. But you, you know, that's amenable to um, mistakes. Um, in that same paper, though, they looked at aerosolized um, virus, and they showed that the virus was viable three hours into aerosolization. Now that, you know, really kind of rocked me when I first read that and looked at the, the paper. The one thing that gave me some comfort is that SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus we're talking about that causes this disease that's been, um, of which the nomenclature is COVID-19, um, it actually showed slightly lower aerosolized potential than SARS-CoV-1, which is the virus that caused the SARS condition in 2003. Now, that's, you know, not a huge um, weight off our shoulders because, of course, that was still a highly transmissible virus. It had an r naught, which is the rate of spread that was still estimated somewhere between two and four, depending on the series. So again, a much more infectious virus than influenza. Um, but when you read the fine print of these studies and you look at the methodologies by which they're uh, measuring these vaporizations, or pardon me, these aerosolizations, you realize that it's, it's, it's under a very ideal laboratory condition where it's got a drum and the drum is spinning and the vapor you know, pellets are, or the, the, the aerosolized droplets are going around in the, in the drum and you're sort of measuring them after a period of time. All of that is to say it's not the real world. So I don't want people to think like, oh my God, if this paper which is, you know, being talked about everywhere, is saying that you can have three hours of aerosolized vapors surviving. That means that you could be walking down the street with nobody around or sitting in the park to try to clear your head. And three hours earlier, someone was there breathing and you're going to get that virus. I just don't think we can make that extrapolation. So, um, you know, yeah, I'm kind of freaking out about some of this stuff, but I'm also just trying to really sense check it and make sure like that really means something. Um, so let's summarize where we think, you know, you're going to get this virus. One, you're definitely able to get this virus if you are within, you know, standing distance of somebody and, you know, you're a few feet or a few meters away and they're sick and they're coughing or if they're um, shedding virus onto a surface that you touch and you, you know, touch your face or something like that. Like you can absolutely get it that way. And I think that's well established. The other place where we are becoming more clear that this thing is shedding is through the GI tract. Now, normally we talk about fecal oral transmission being a huge issue when it comes to things like hepatitis A or a lot of the nasty gastroenteritis type bugs. But I think it's clear that SARS can spread in that way as well. Pardon me, sorry. when I say SARS, I mean SARS-CoV-2, the virus at, at hand here. So, um, you know, if, if you're not in the habit of washing your hands a lot, this is, this is a great time to build that habit. Um, so, you know, for example, I'll, I'll give you one, one practical way that this has, you know, infiltrated what I'm doing. You know, if I order a package from Amazon and it comes to the door, you know, I'm opening it outside. And when I bring this stuff from 
you know, from outside to inside, I'm wiping it off. I'm washing it off with like a, a Windex type Lysol, you know, cleaner. And then I'm washing my hands. And I'm not just kind of doing one of these things where I put my hand under the soap, put a little bit of soap on. No, I'm doing it kind of like it was like when I was back in my residency where I'm like doing this real serious scrub, 20 to 30 seconds, like going out of my way to get every little, you know, crevice in my hand and up my wrist. Um, and is that taking my risk to zero? Nope, it's not, probably not. Is it reducing my risk? Yep, is it overkill? Maybe, but this is called the precautionary principle. There's very little downside in me taking those steps um, and there's potentially upside. And again, I'm not delusional to think that that means it's impossible um, to, to not contract the virus, but it's the kind of step you can take that makes a difference. So again, um, on this point of aerosolization, we're looking into it more closely. I think that some of these initial reports are hopefully scarier than they need to be. Um, and I don't think that if you're walking through a park and there's nobody around and you're just breathing air that, you know, you could breathe in a vapor, um, you know, some vapor and, and some droplets of virus that from someone that was breathing three hours ago. That's not how I'm reading that literature, uh, despite the, the fact that it could be read that way if you were just reading the tables and not the fine print.